Volume 2, Chapter 8 of Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Braunert Plunkett. Cats. Their points and characteristics with curiosities of cat life and a chapter on feline ailments by W. Gordon Staples. Volume 2 chapter eight odds and ends when my pet cat read the heading of this chapter she sarcastically remarked humph i suppose you mean that cat's tails are the ends but what's the odds theodore nero raised his chin slightly from the carpet to add so long's you're happy you brood said muffy you don't know what you're talking about you always are half asleep but touching cat's tails it wouldn't be the best policy to touch every cat's tail however a lady asked me seriously at a dinner the other day why does a cat waggle its tail such a question at such a time was a poser and to comfort me she added that she really was asking for information i answered as dundreary because the cat is stronger than its tail if the tail was the stronger the tail would waggle the cat. Cats are extremely proud of their tails. Pulling a Jew's beard and a cat's tail are indignities of an equality. Doubtless, did mankind possess these appendages, he would be equally jealous of their honor. But they have been overlooked somehow in the outfitting. But just imagine how gingerly we gentlemen would use them. How elegantly we would carry them under our arms while walking, and how we would flare up if anyone trod on our tail. Imagine Patty at a fair. Twelve o'clock and no fight yet. Will any gentleman just spit on the point of my tail? How useful, too, tails would be in many ways in riding, driving, or boating. On a rainy day, one's umbrella might be tied to it so as to have both hands free, and in mobs and crowds it could be worn out of sight. How handy to dig your neighbor in the ribs with and say, sly dog, or don't you see, don't you see, when you'd made a bad pun. How useful to the orator for elegant gesticulation to give point to an argument or to indicate derision. For example, Lord Chief Justice, did you poke your tail at me, sir? Claimant, no, my lord, I... Lord Chief Justice, very well, sir, don't do it again that's all how convenient the british sailor would find a tail when aloft reefing topsails and sure wouldn't jack also use it as a tobacco stopper if men had tails the medical profession would be benefited thereby there would be several new diseases and new operations how beautifully this would sound for instance compound commutative fracture of the middle third of caudal extremity or amputation at the tenth caudal vertebra which would give rise to advertisements like the following turner's circular splint and beautiful easy fitting caudal appendages equal to nature patronized by the illustrious duke of dunmore whose tail was carried away by a five hundred pounder at the battle of dorking during the famous charge of the gallant london scottish only seven and six the ends of justice too would be assisted new laws would be added to the penal code garroters would be condemned to two years imprisonment and deprivation of codicity lesser offences punished by six months and six inches of tail thus we should easily know a rogue in the street when we met one i must stop i feel i should warm to the subject and one of such vast ramifications ought to have more space for its consideration than i can afford however to bandmasters acrobats public speakers parsons painters and policemen tales would indeed be invaluable and upon my honour when i come to think of it i only wonder how human beings have come to be overlooked in this little matter cats it may be observed wag their tails when pleased when angry they lash them and when excited and about to spring on their prey the tail quivers 
this is all involuntary on the part of the pussy and is an index of the state of her feelings the tail being principally supplied with nerves from the spinal cord and along this cord the nervous force is carried from the brain why do cats always fall on their feet this question is by no means difficult to answer when she first falls from a height her back is lowermost and she is bent in a semicircle if she fell thus fracture of the spine and death would be the inevitable result but natural instinct induces her after she has fallen a foot or two to suddenly extend the muscles of her back and stretch her legs the belly now becomes the convexity and the back concave thus altering the center of gravity and bringing her round then she has only to hold herself in this position in order to alight on her feet one day lately a lady who lives in the fourth story of a house in dundee hung the cage with a canary on a nail outside the window the cat from the inside watched it for some time till unable any longer to withstand the temptation she made a spring and somehow missing the cage fell to the ground some forty feet but she alighted on her feet and walked off as if nothing had occurred cats are wonderfully sure-footed i saw a cat one day taking an airing along a housetop where blondin could hardly have walked without a pole she had a kitten in her mouth too to make her performance all the more entertaining another puss i saw sitting on an iron rail a few feet from the ground and apparently fast asleep the rail was only about one inch in diameter and she sat there fully an hour very few cats care to drink spirituous liquors dogs are not so particular one dog i had once on board ship a labrador retriever used to attend the call of grogo every day and get his allowance along with the men he never got drunk though and he showed his wisdom by taking it well watered i know a little bull terrier bitch who goes to a hotel every day she has a chance her favorite tipple is beer poured upon a salver as she cannot speak she sits in a chair and thinks a lot as she always meets plenty of friends willing to stand treat she never comes home sober i saw her a few weeks ago trying in vain to cross the street at last she sat down in the middle and barked to me i was sorry to see a well-bred young lady in such a condition so i helped her home for which she showed gratitude next day but my father had a cat a big tom whom the servants used to make drunk at any time his beverage was scotch whisky bros i e oatmeal and whisky and i've seen him come staggering into the parlor and tumble over the leg of the table then he would fall asleep cats as a rule do not like music although if brought up in a musical family they learn to tolerate it a cat is easily taught to come when whistled upon a friend of mine has a cat who if he commences to whistle a tune immediately jumps on his breast and rubs her head all over his face as if trying to comfort him having the notion no doubt that he is in some sort of anguish but if he puts out his hand to take down his fiddle in her presence she at once erects her back and tail and growls at him in unmistakable anger however in this she shows her good taste for her master is certainly the most execrable performer that ever tickled hair on gut there are many old superstitions regarding cats still extant and many foolish notions about them that had much better be unlearned sailors believe that if the ship's cat be lost overboard shipwreck or some such disaster is almost sure to follow my own old captain commander mcgage was imbued with this notion hence his extreme care to retain the black cat on board as depicted in the tale which follows this chapter the skipper's imp witches are supposed by some to be constantly attended by an evil spirit in the shape of a black cat to dream of cats is considered very unlucky in some of the more unfrequented districts of scotland 
the good folks are still very careful to shut up their cats in the house on Halloween, i.e. the 31st of October. And they tell me that those cats that have managed to escape incarceration, that night may be seen by those brave enough to look, scampering over hill and dell and across the lonely moors, each one ridden by a brownie, a boggle, a spunky, or some other infernal jockey. In fact, a devil's own steeplechase. And they say those cats never produce young again. Or if they do, the sooner the kittens are put out of sight, the better. They are subject to startings in their sleep, no wonder, have a weird, unearthly look about their eyes, and soon pine away and die, and go, we shudder to say with her. Cats are supposed to be capital prognosticators of the weather. If a cat is seen washing her face with more than usual assiduity, it is going to be stormy, and if pussy sits much with her back to the fire, you may expect frost and snow in winter and thunder and lightning with hail in summer. Some portion of pussy's person seems indeed to retain the power of foretelling the weather, even after death, as witness that common toy which poor people use instead of a barometer, a wee-wee man and a wee-wee woman living together in a wee-wee house. One of them pops out every day. If the day is to be fine, the lady comes. If not, like a loving wife, she sends her good man out. The secret is, the little couple are suspended on catgut, which twists or untwists according to the state of the atmosphere. There is a very common popular fallacy regarding cats sucking an infant's breath and killing it. The idea is simply preposterous. Cats, being extremely fond of children, naturally like to get into the cradle, to lie beside and watch them. They often crouch upon the child's breast. This may impede breathing, more or less, according to the relative size of the cat to the baby. If the cat actually sits upon the child's face, then, indeed, the poor creature may be suffocated. But such an occurrence is so very rare that it is hardly worth mentioning. Many more deaths occur from bad arrangement of a baby's pillow, in which case the mother must be glad when there is a cat to put the blame upon. Cats have any amount of wiliness about them. A dog would scarcely think of hiding below a bush until its prey came within reach, but cats are adepts at such an ambuscade. A cat knows by experience that a bird, say a sparrow, looks almost in every direction, saving directly beneath it, and so pussy always steals a march on it from below. If a bird is foolish enough to alight on the top of a cloth pole, pussy has a very easy victory. It is that same habit of never looking downwards which causes those large birds which alight on a ship's yard to be so easily captured by the sailors. Instances of jealousy are by no means uncommon in the feline race. Jealousy is an indication of a sensitive nature, and no animal in the world is more sensitive than a cat. A lady had a pretty little pussy which she had saved from drowning. This cat was excessively fond of its mistress, was never absent from her while in the house, and outside used to follow her like a dog. But in course of time, this lady bought a parrot, and pussy must have thought her mistress was paying the bird too much attention, for all of a sudden the cat's nature seemed entirely changed. It did not respond to the lady's caresses. It would sit for an hour at the time, looking with gathered brows at the parrot, and instead of accompanying her mistress abroad, she remained sulking indoors. In truth, the cat was breaking her heart. Her glossy fur got dry and rough, and at last she refused all food, so as she really loved her cat, this lady parted with her parrot, although with great reluctance. Pussy recovered at once. The effect seemed magical, and in a few days she was herself again, the same fun-loving, frolicsome, loving wee cat she had been before. A gentleman had a cat whom he had called Pimento. The Pimento tree, the reader will remember, is said to permit no rival plant to grow within its shade. 
There was another cat in the same house, but Pimento, although otherwise a nice cat and gentle and loving in the extreme, would never allow his master to pay the slightest attention to this cat. If he did, there was a row at once, and if his master protected the other cat, then Pimento at once left the room growling and in high dudgeon. In a house where I resided, says a correspondent, there were two cats, a young and an old one. The young one was a smart, clever animal with a decided turn for humor. The other liked to be taken notice of. One day I was paying some attention to the latter, which, of course, was highly pleased. With tail erect, it walked backward and forward. The young one, which had been pretending to be asleep, suddenly seized hold of the tail of the other with its paw, gave it a sharp pull, and was again in a sleeping attitude, ere the other had time to look around. The old one turned about, saw the young one apparently asleep, and me laughing. It immediately retired to a corner of the room, thinking, no doubt, that I was a double villain. Did the reader observe how very fond cats are of sitting on paper? One can hardly have a pet puss and not observe this trait. If you have a book on your lap, up jumps pussy and seats herself right on top of it. If you are writing a letter, pussy creeps along the table, singing so that you can hardly be angry with her, and places herself on the writing materials. My present puss prefers the daily telegraph to anything else for a bed at night, or to have her kittens on, indeed, if the standard is lying on the same sofa and she gets onto it by mistake, she will very soon get off and on to the telegraph. Are cats revengeful? Never as a rule. Yet they do sometimes display little pettish outbursts of temper. They would not be like women if they did not do that. A lady tells me that when she's riding, her cat will sometimes come and plant herself right in the way, and when gently pushed off, she suddenly loses her temper and pitches the writing materials right and left onto the floor. The following anecdote is highly illustrative of the kind and quality of Pussy's Revenge. Now for the story of the cat, she was a lovely black and white Kabul cat, the same as Persian, with hair like floss silk as long as one's finger, and as wise as a great many human beings. She had a great dislike to roast mutton cold, and when I had nothing else to offer her, her resentment was most marked. She refused my caresses and walked straight off to my dressing room, where on the top of the chest of drawers stood my bonnet box. She jumped up and administered slaps to the box until it fell on the floor when she would come away at once, her revenge being gratified. This occurred on several occasions and only when she was offered a cold mutton dinner. Was not the knowledge of what would distress my feminine feelings a wonderful piece of intelligence? We quite looked out for it after the first few times and would watch her walking off to my room and then in a minute or two there would be bump, bump and my husband would say, there goes your bonnet. I only know one instance of what might be called a revenge proper. It was a large black cat of the name of Imp. The poor fellow was exceedingly ill-used by the servant-maid, who used to beat him on every occasion possible. Imp's dislike to the girl was very great, although he evidently was afraid to attack her, but one day the servant was coming downstairs with a tray of dishes, and seeing both her hands full, Imp thought he ought not to miss such a golden opportunity for retaliation. He accordingly flew at her and scratched both her arms and face severely. So we see that cats, although gentle and forgiving in the extreme to those who love them, do not easily forget an injury from the hands of a stranger or cat hater. The reader must have often heard that cats seem to possess some wonderful instinct which enables them to predict certain kinds of coming calamities, such as earthquakes and different sorts of explosion. Personally, I know one instance of this, 
although I cannot explain it, our ship's cat taking to the rigging and sitting on the main truck before our vessel was discovered to be on fire. Another I have from my grandfather, an officer in the first royals, at the time of the last Anglo-Franco war. My grandmother was bending down, taking something from a chest on the floor, when suddenly the whole window was blown to splinters, dust almost, around her, with the thunder of some dreadful explosion. It was a transport that had entered the harbor, Kiel, I think, some days before, laden with war munitions, and which had blown up with all hands. But it was remarked by everyone on the quay that the ship's cat had been sitting all the morning of the explosion on the vessel's main truck. Cats are sometimes very fond of horses. I know an instance of this where the stable cat was very much attached to a certain horse, and that animal evidently reciprocated the cat's kindly feelings. And Pussy used to stand quietly and allow the horse to lick her fur the wrong way, and indeed seemed to enjoy it. We all know how proud Miss Puss is of her song. Barring a certain drowsy monotony, which acts like a narcotic both on herself and kittens, and at times even on human beings, there isn't much melody in it, however. This power of singing becomes lost in sickness and also in extreme old age. I know of a cat of very advanced years that had given up singing for many a day until a kitten, a famous musician in its way, came to reside at her house. Then old poor pussy tried hard to get out a bar or two, and her efforts to succeed were quite ludicrous. Being laughed at, she flew into a passion and put her spite out on the happy little kitten. The more the spirited pussy was thrashed, however, the louder it sang, so the old cat left the room in disgust. The days and years of a cat's life are on an average fourteen, but many live very much longer. Fifteen and seventeen are very common ages for pussy to die at. The longest time I have ever known a cat live was till its twenty-second year, but I have heard of them dying at the age of thirty. It is quite a common thing for a cat to feed itself with milk or cream by dipping her forepaw in the jug and then licking it. Pussy is very awkward at drinking water from a crystal tumbler. At first, she will generally thrust her head too far in, which will make her sneeze. Then she will sit and eye the glass for a time, as if considering how far the water comes up. Not content with ocular demonstration, she will next put a paw cautiously in until the extreme end of her toes touches the water, and thus, after marking the distance, she can drink in comfort. A certain cat, which had been reared on the spoon, used, when full grown, to sit up on her hind legs and, reaching down the spoon to her mouth with her paws, swallow the contents. The same cat used to drink milk if poured into her mouth from a jug or any dish with a spout to it. So expert at that trick did she become, that, sitting up as usual, she used to receive and swallow a continuous stream poured into her throat from a height of three feet. For the subject matter of the remainder of this chapter, I am indebted to a lady who takes a great interest in feline nature. It is certain, she says, that cats have some strange instincts that sense them when lost or starving to certain people. They have followed me in gay crowded streets and met me in fields. I have gone into shops and bought milk and rolls for the starvelings, and have gone again to the same place, and they were gone. Doubtless, cats on the tramp and destitute. I have known a friend's cat lost for five days, and it never attempted to make its sorrows known until I passed before the window of an underground room, when her shrieks were horrible to hear and so prolonged that the passers-by stopped to listen. I remained speaking to the poor creature, whose claws were rattling against the shut door until the key was brought and pussy set free. She relates an instance of a young surgeon who was on his way to join his ship, to sail to the antipodes, and who was followed to the very boat by a pretty little kitten. 
as it seemed bent on being a sailor the surgeon put the poor thing in his pocket it was presented to a lady on board who was interested in its story and is now doing duty among the cats of south australia a country by the by where cats are more fully appreciated than here beda was a beautiful blue tabby one summer's morning down in devon she had been missed for hours and on being called a viper glided out from a thicket in the garden closely followed by the cat the snake until killed by a lady kept moving off but every moment turning round and hissing at beda who however was in no ways put about the following also tends to show that cats have no fear of snakes at artia in the province of orissa a cobra had his den under a mulberry tree near a garden log one day our english tabby cat beda had been missing with all her kits for some hours she was found at the foot of the mulberry tree teaching her children to pat the cobra on the head every time he popped it out when the head was protruded too far a stroke from puss herself caused its speedy withdrawal thinking the game dangerous the cobra which measured two inches in diameter was dug out and killed we were afterwards told by the natives that no snake will kill a cat as they dislike the fur cats are like dogs and generally have a favorite among the litter the handsomest once when beda was nursing in india a wild cat sprang in by the open window and tried to seize the kittens beda made off with her pet and the wild cat was beaten out beda however forgot where she had hidden the favorite nor would she be consoled with the other members of her family a search was accordingly made and the pet kitten at last found on a sofa in an adjoining bungalow this lady's cat never attempted to touch the canary nor indeed any birds about the place End of Volume 2, Chapter 8、Volume、two, Chapter Nine of Cats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Sterner. Cats, Their Points and Characteristics, with Curiosities of Cat Life. And a chapter on feline ailments, by W. Gordon Staples, Volume Two, Chapter Nine, The Two Muffies, A Tale. While I was yet a little schoolboy, there came about my father's house and premises a plague of rats. They came in their thousands, as if summoned by the trumpet tones of a rodentine bradlaw or ogre. They took the farmyard and outhouses by storm. Laid siege to the dwelling house, and from the thoroughly businesslike manner they conducted their operations and went into winter quarters, it was quite evident they meditated a stay of some duration. Sappers and miners, or royal engineers, were employed to drive tunnels and galleries under every floor, and passages leading to the grain lofts above. Foraging parties were appointed to every stack of corn and rick of hay. The hen house was laid under the contribution to furnish eggs and feathers, and blackmail was levied from the very cows. The eaves of the well thatched barns and byres were appointed to their wives, their aged and infirm, while the poor sparrows were dislodged from their comfortable, well lined nests to make room for little naked baby rats. And so effectively was every department worked, and so well did every branch of the service do its duty. That Cardwell himself, nay, even Bismarck Multi and Company, could not have suggested anything in the way of improvement. At all these doings, my honest father looked very blue, and employed his time principally in expending various sums of money in vermin killers and in reading works on toxicology. The results of his study was that many tempting morsels and savoury tit bits were placed in convenient corners for the benefit of the invaders. It seemed indeed for their benefit. They didn't care a straw for tartarametic, appeared to get fat on arsenic, while strychnia only strengthened their nervous systems and morphia made them fierce. Now Gibby was the house cat, a very large and beautiful red tabby. In his prime, he had been a perfect nimrod of the feline race. 
scorning such feeble game as the domestic mouse. His joy was to ramble free and unfettered among the woods and forests, by the loneliest spots at a river's brink, and among the mountains and rocks, often prolonging his hunting excursions for days together, but never returning without a leveret or a fine young rabbit. These fruits of the chase he did not always bring home, but often presented to his various human friends in the adjoining village, for Gibby was known far and near, and even his lordship's surly old gamekeeper, though he raised his gun at the sight of the cat, forbore to fire when he saw who the bold trespasser was. Many a rare and beautiful bird did Gibby carry home alive, among others I remember a beautiful specimen of the corncrake, nor can I forget Pussy's manifest disgust when the bird was allowed to fly away. Just two days after he brought home a crow, but this time the head was wanting. By the banks of the Denburn he one day fought and slew a large polecat. This he carefully skinned and dragged home. Gibby was as well known in the countryside as the witch-wife, or the pack-merchant, and more respected than either and people often came to our house to beg for a nicht o gibby, as the rottens, rats, at their own town, farm, were getting rather rang and cheeky. The loan was always granted. Gibby go, was all my mother would say, and off trotted puss by the party side, and his tail gaily on the perpendicular, for he knew, as well as a cat could, that rare sport and a rich treat of the sweetest cream would be the reward of his compliance but Gilbert did not confine himself to hunting only. He was an expert fisher. For hours he would watch on one spot on the banks of a river, with his eyes riveted on the water, until some unhappy trout came out to bask in the sun's rays. This was Gibby's opportunity. For a moment only his lips and tail quivered with extreme anxiety, then down, swift as a solan goose, he had dived with aim unerring, and seized his finny prey, with which he came quietly to bank, and trotted off homewards to enjoy the delicious morsel in some quiet corner all to himself. Rabbits, hares, and game of all kinds Gibby parted with freely, but a trout was a treat, and he never shared it with man or mortal. But Gibby was old now, Nineteen summers had come and gone since he had skylarked with his mother's tail, and his limbs had waxed stiff, and his once bright eyes were dimmed. He seldom went to the woods now, and when he did he returned sorrowfully and minus. He preferred to doze by the parlor fire or nurse his rheumatism before the kitchen grate, and while nodding over the embers, many a scene, I warrant, of his earlier years came to his recollection and many a stirring adventure by flood and field stole vividly back to memory, and thus he'd fight his battles o'er again and kill his rabbits thrice. Gibby, said my father one day, thoughtfully removing his pipe from his mouth, Gibby, you've got some game in you yet, old boy. Oh, aye, said Gibby, for he was the pink of politeness, and never failed to reply when civilly addressed. Well, continued my father, you shall have a good supper, and a night among the rats in the grain loft. Warum, replied the cat, which doubtless meant that he was perfectly willing, and that it would be a bad job for the rats. So the program was duly carried out, and Master Gilbert was shut up among the foe. In the early morning my father, who had not closed an eye all night, opened the door, and lame and bleeding out limped his favorite, shaking his poor head, raw with wounds, in the most pitiful manner possible. The brave beast had fought like a tiger all the night long. Nearly two score of rats lay dead around, while the blood lay in pools on the decks, with as much hair and fluff as if a dozen Kilkenny cats had been contending for victory, and got it. That night's ratting proved fatal to old Gibby. The dreadful wounds he had received never healed, and after much deliberation it was determined that an end should be put to the poor animal's sufferings. So honest Hewick, a stable boy, was sent with Gibby in a bag to drown him. "'Is he gone?' said my mother anxiously when he returned, as we bairns were all in tears. "'Gone, ma'am,' replied Hewick. "'Aye, if he had been a horse, and, begging your pardon, a devil forby, 
the river would a taem to doon, sick as bait, flood, I never saw in my born days. Notwithstanding all this, Gibby was at that moment finishing the contents of his saucer and drying his wet sides before a sitting-room fire, and when we entered he was singing a song to himself like the ancient philosopher he was. But the poor cat lived but one short week longer. He died, as Bardy Burns has it, a fair stray death in his own nook, and was slowly and sadly laid to rest beneath an aged rowan tree at the end of the garden. And the berries on that tree grew redder ever after, at least we thought so, but we never dared to taste or touch them. They were sacred to the memory of poor dead and gone Gibby. In the meantime the plague of rats continued unabated, and their ravages seemed rather to increase than diminish, but their reign was nearly at an end. One day my father received the joyful intelligence that a splendid young lady kitten was in need of a comfortable home, salary no object. Away with a basket trudged my little brother and self, and after a long walk came to young Pussy's residence, and had the satisfaction of finding both kitten and mistress at home. The former, indeed a beauty, and faultlessly marked, was engaged alternately in drinking buttermilk and washing her face before a small looking-glass. I, my bonny bairn, I was the bonny bairn, not my brother, she's a perfect wee angel, and ye moan be good to her, ye moan a purr her by the tail, and ye moan gie her lots o' milk, and never let her want for a looking-glass. We promised to grudge her nothing that could in any way conduce to her happiness and comfort, and were allowed to carry her off. Before we reached home we had taken her from the basket, and with all the solemnity the occasion demanded, baptized her in a running stream, and called her the name Muffy. Once fairly established in her new quarters, the kit lost no time in commencing hostilities against the rats, and blood, not buttermilk, became her war cry. One day, as she sat admiring herself in the glass, a large rat unexpectedly appeared in the kitchen, and although but a little larger than herself, Kitty at once gave chase, not only to his hole, but into his hole. For the next three minutes the squeaking was quite harrowing to listen to, but presently Pussy reappeared, stern foremost, and dragging with her the rat, dead. This she deposited before the fire, glowing when anyone went near it as much as to say, Lay but a finger on it, and you yourself may expect to pay the same penalty for your rashness. The little thing, indeed, seemed swelling with pride and importance, and must have felt considerably bigger than an ordinary-sized ox, and as fierce as a Bengal tiger. In one moment she had bounded from kit to cathood. Buttermilk and a looking-glass, bah! Blood alone could satisfy her ambition now. Little Muffy was left at night in sole charge of the kitchen, and next morning no less than five large rats lay side by side on the hearth, as if waiting a post-mortem, and wee pussy, with her white breast dabbled with gore, exhausted and asleep, lay beside them. In less than a week she had bagged upwards of forty, and no doubt wounded twice that number. And now fear and consternation began to spread in the enemy's camp. Such doings had never been heard of among them, even traditionally. The oldest inhabitant shook his grey muzzle and gave it up, but added, Friends, brethren, rodents, it is time to shift. No one knows whose turn may come next. True, it is a pity to leave such jolly quarters when everything was going on so pleasantly. We have seen our fattest wives and our biggest braves borne off. Our helpless babes have not been safe from the clutches of that dreaded monster, with the ferocity of a fiend and the skin of a mouse, and lest worst befall us, go we must. And go they did. Old Tom Riddle, the parish clerk, who might have been seen any night staggering homewards in the short hours, was well nigh scared out of the little wits that remained to him by meeting, as he said, Thousands upon thousands o' rottens, harden up the road in the direction o' the farm o' Brockenclaw. Confound it, he said, when someone ventured to cast a doubt on his statement. Wasn't it bright moonlicht? And didn't I see them wi' my ain een, carrying their weans in their mouths, and leading their blind with a stray? Whether old Tom exaggerated or not is hard to say, 
but sure enough, next morning there was not a rat to be seen or heard about my father's premises. And it is likewise correct that about the same time the honest farmer of Brockenclaw began to complain loudly of the destruction by these gentry of his straw and oats. He liked, he said, to see a few of the beasties rinnin' about a farm tune. That was a sign of plenty, but when they could be counted by the score, it fairly beat cock -fetchin. For the next twelve months of her existence, Muffy led a very quiet and peaceful life. She was now in her prime, and a more beautifully marked tabby it would have been difficult to imagine. But as yet no male of her species had gained her youthful affections. But her time soon came, for strolling one day in the woods, trying to pick up a nice fat linnet for her dinner, Muffy met her fate, and her fate followed her home even to the garden gate, then darted off again to his native woodlands. His history was briefly this. He was not born of respectable parentage, and I question, too, whether his parents were at all more honest than they ought to have been. His mother was a half-wild animal, brought by a half-cracked colonel from the West Indies, and she bore him in the woods, and there she suckled and reared him, and it was no doubt owing to the wild gypsy life he led, and the amount of freedom and fresh air he enjoyed, that he grew so fine an animal. At any rate, I never have seen his match. An immense red tabby he was, with short ears on a massive head, splendid eyes, and a tail that no wildcat need have been ashamed of. Muffy and her lover used to hold their own meetings in the ruins of an old house near a wood, and my brothers and I made a rash vow to attempt the capture of the beautiful stranger in this same building. Accordingly, one fine moonlit night, missing Lady Muff and guessing she was on the spoon, we sallied out and made our way to the ruin. My brothers were told off to guard the door and windows, and on me alone devolved the somewhat unpleasant duty of bagging the cat. With this intention I entered as cautiously as a mouse, and sure enough there sat the happy pair contentedly on the cold hearthstone. So engrossed were they in looking at each other that they never perceived me until quite close upon them. With the agility of a young monkey, I threw myself on the tomcat and seized him by the back. That is exactly what I did. His proceedings were somewhat different, and considerably more to the point, for after making his four teeth meet in the fleshy part of my middle finger, he slid from my grasp like a conger eel, and went hand over hand up the chimney, followed by the justly indignant Lady Muff, and I was left lamenting. For the next six weeks I had the satisfaction of going to school with my arm in a sling. I say satisfaction, because my misfortune was the cause of a great alteration in the manner of the schoolmaster towards me. Previously it was usual with me to be thrashed, to die and well shaken, which is not at all nice on a winter's day. But now all this was changed, and I was not beaten at all. The pedagogue spoke to me subduedly, and with a certain amount of conciliatory awe in his manner, I observed that he always kept a chair or form between my person and his, lest I should at any time take hydrophobia without giving sufficient warning and bite the poor man. Seeing how well the sling worked, I did not hesitate to wear it, for fully a month after my hand was quite healed, with the exception of the cicatrices, which the grave only will obliterate. Although beaten in our first efforts, we did not give up the idea of capturing this vagabond Tom Tabby, yet it was only through the instrumentality of Muffy we eventually succeeded. We kept her at home, put a saucerful of creamy milk in a shady nook of the garden for her lover, and whenever he appeared, which he always did at the hour of gloaming, his betrothed was permitted to meet him. And although he invariably beseeched her to fly with him, she was prevented from acceding to his very reasonable request by being tethered to a gooseberry bush by a long string. Love and time tamed this feline Ingomar. He left his abode in the forest, exchanged the wild woods shade for the stable's roof, bartered his freedom for the ties of matrimony or catrimony. In short, he married Muffy, adopted civilization, and became Barncat par excellence. But no amount of persuasion could ever entice him into the dwelling-house, nor did he ever suffer a human finger to pollute his fur. 
I am sorry to say that Ingemar did not at all times behave well to his wife. In fact, at times he was a brute. It was his pleasure that she should sit for hours together in the garden, simply that he might look at her. If she as much as hinted at retiring, he treated her exactly as the Lancashire clodhoppers do their wives. He knocked her down and jumped upon her. Muffy had five bonny kittens, and she put them to bed on the parlor sofa. Ingemar detested refinement as much as Rob Roy did. The sons of MacGregor weavers, bring those kittens forth and place them here on straw. I will see to their rearing. That is what Ingemar said, and Muffy mutely complied, and those kittens grew up as wild as himself. From sparrows they got to chickens, from chickens to grouse and game generally, and when got into trouble with the keeper and had the worst of the argument, which on his part was double-barreled. In the early days of his betrothal, Ingemar threw daisies at his beloved, and gambled with her in mimic strife. But latterly his song was hushed at eventide, and spits and clouts and flying fur were too often the order of the day. Poor Ingemar! He was cut down in his prime, slain by a wretched collie-dog. Slowly and sadly we bore him in, his beautiful fur all dabbled in blood, and his once bright eyes fast glazing in death, and tenderly laid him at the widow Muffy's feet. Now listen to the remarkable behavior of that lady. The widowed Muffy did not weep, neither, in consequence of not weeping, did she die. She did an attitude, though, then growled and spat, and spitting, growled again, and finally gave vent to her feelings by springing through the parlor window and escaping to the woods. And here the shame and sorrow for feline inconsistency, but in the interests of truth be it written, not only did Muffy not remain long a widow, but that brief widowhood even was stained by many acts of levity to the memory of the murdered Ingemar. His skin beautifully preserved, that skin she did not hesitate to use as a mat, nay, she even gambled with the tail of it, and although she often paid a visit to her husband's grave, it was not to weep she went there, no, but literally to dance on the top of it. Such is life, such are relics. The rest of this pussy's life was entirely uneventful. One circumstance only deserves relating. She was exceedingly fond of me, in fact, quite adored me. Oh, that is nothing, other felines have done the same. But Muffy did what I dare say other females wouldn't. She at any time would eat a little bit of the candle or a bit of greased peat from my hand while refusing beefsteak or cream from anyone else. When I was sent to distant school and could only visit my home once a week or fortnight, the house bereft of me had no longer any charms for poor Muffy, and she took to the woods. Perhaps she enjoyed rambling amid scenes hallowed by the recollection of her early love. She seldom returned home until the day of my accustomed arrival, when she was always there to welcome me. Now that she should have known the usual day for my appearance was nothing remarkable, but it was strange that if anything interfered with my coming, Puss was also absent. Nor did my arrival on any other day prevent her from being home at least an hour before me. One day, alas, that one day that must come to all created things, my Muffy was not there to meet me, and she never came again. After a long search I found her beneath a tree, stark and stiff, her gentle eyes were closed, for I, I would never feel again her soft caress, nor hear her loving purr, dear Muffy, was dead. But dry your eyes, gentle lady, and listen to the story of Muffy the Second. I call my present cat Muffy, partly in remembrance of my old favorite, and partly because I think it's such a cozy little name for a pet puss. Bless her little heart, she is sitting on my shoulder while I write, and no slight burden either, her fighting weight being somewhat over twelve pounds. A splendid tabby, she is evenly and prettily marked, her lovely face vandite with white, and her nose tipped with crimson, like a mountain daisy. She is six years of age, and the mother of over one hundred kittens. Three-fourths of these have found respectable homes, most of them were bespoken before birth, and if they had only been half as prolific as their mother, Muffy must be progenitor of thousands. 
A very ambitious kitten you were, too, my pretty muff. I first picked you up at a hotel, when no bigger than a ball of worsted. Your brothers and sisters, even your big ugly mother, turned and fled. But you stood and spat, didn't you, puss? And that fetched me. Your favorite seat, too, was the top of the parlor door, and during the first twelve months of your existence, sure didn't you tear into pieces three sets of window curtains, didn't you smash all the flower pots, weren't you constantly clutching down the tablecloth and breaking the china and glass, running along the keyboard of the piano and jumping down the stool? What chance did a silk umbrella stand with you, and what hope of existence had my patent leather boots? Was it fair to catch flies on my sunset on Aaron before the paint was dry? Was it right to upset my ink bottle on the tablecloth, or to break the head off my spraying Samuel, which head you coolly made a mouse of, and finally hid in my shoe? Or was it at all proper to make such earnest, though happily unsuccessful, endeavors to hook your master's eyes out as soon as he opened them in the morning? But marriage sobered you, Muffy and I never can forget the extreme joy you manifested on the birth of your first kittens. Your first idea, I'm told, was to make mousies of them. Then you thought of eating them. But how anxiously you waited my arrival on that auspicious morning. You came twice to my bedroom to hurry me down, and I dared not stop to shave. Then each kitten in succession was held up between your forepaws to receive its just meed of admiration. But I hardly think, Miss Muff, your song of joy would have been quite so loud and jubilant had you known I was selecting two to drown. And each succeeding period since then you have tried to have your kittens in my bed, and twice you have been only too successful. There now, go down, my shoulder aches. Besides, I have to address the British public. Muffy, like her master, has been a wanderer, and she prefers it. To her, home and master are synonymous terms. Were I to make my bed in the midst of a highland moor, she would not desert me. If I were to place my sea-chest on the top of a dark Loch Nargar, and that would be no easy matter, and leave it there for a month, I should find Muffy on the top of it when I returned. It might very naturally be supposed that a cat could form but a poor travelling companion, and be rather troublesome. It is all custom, I suppose. Miss Muff, at the smallest computation, must have travelled nearly twenty thousand miles with me, and she can always take care of herself much better than a dog can. From constant experience, she has become quite cosmopolitan in her habits. On the evening before flitting day, she is more than usually active, ambling around and snuffling at each box as it is being packed and rubbing her shoulder against it, singing all the while in the most exhilarating manner. As night closes, she, as a rule, with few exceptions, disappears for a time, going most likely to bid good-bye to her friends, whom she seldom sees again in this world, but never fails to be back early in the morning, when after a hurried breakfast she curls herself up in her little travelling creel and goes quietly off to sleep. In a railway carriage or steamboat, she is allowed to roam about at her own sweet will, but by night her place is by her master's side, and a more faithful watch he could not have. On arriving at a hotel, after dinner, Pussy is permitted to go out and see the place. The first night of her sojourn in a strange town is always spent by Muffy in the open air, and, wonderful to relate, she always enters in the morning by the front door, although put out at the back. How she can find her way round with accuracy sometimes a distance of half a mile of strange streets, or how she can tell the hotel door from any other, I cannot say, but she does. Once I gave her basket in charge of a railway porter at a London station to take upstairs while I got my own ticket and the dogs. The poor fellow soon returned with bleeding face and hands to say that the cat had escaped and disappeared in the crowd. There was no time to wait to look for her. My luggage was on board, and the train about to start, so I hurried off to take my seat. Very much to my surprise, I was hailed from a first-class carriage by my pet herself, who appeared rejoiced to see me, and indeed was much more calm and self-possessed under the circumstances than her master. Once in a strange town, Liverpool, 
Muffy disappeared in the most mysterious manner and was absent for three whole weeks. From some words that I had heard the landlady's son drop, I suspected foul play. So I went straight to the offices of the city scavengering department to prefer a very modest request, viz., to have all the ash pits cleaned out within a certain radius of my lodgings. All this work for a cat, said the chief inspector. Why, such a thing has no precedent. And he smiled at my cheek, I suppose. But, said I, you can make this case the precedent, and it is so valuable a cat, you know. Aid came from an unexpected quarter. One of the officers was a Scotchman, who took my part like everything. Valuable property, he argued, had been stolen and destroyed, and if we should wait until the usual time for cleaning the ash pits, all hope of putting the blame on the right party would be lost forever. What chance, said his good-natured chief, have I against two of you? So the order was given, and the ash pits emptied. This took two or three mornings' work, and many dead cats were found. In fact, every day I held a post-mortem examination on one or two poor brutes, and of course the men wanted a glass of grog, so that the business cost me a power of rum. But no dead Muffy appeared. In the meantime I had to go to London without my puss, and a few days later Lady Muff likewise arrived by train. She had returned to my rooms at Liverpool, exactly three weeks from the day she disappeared, and had kittens one hour after. Muffy, I do not think, ever killed a mouse, although very fond of catching them. All she cares for is the sport. She invariably brings her little victim into my room, and placing it on the hearth rug, looks up at my face and mews, as much to say, Just observe, master, the fun I shall have with this little cuss, and see what a clever mouser your muff is. While she is saying this, the mouse has escaped, but is speedily recaptured and returned to the rug. After throwing it up in the air two or three times and catching it before it falls, the wee, cowering, timorous beastie is left to its own freedom, Muffy walking away in a careless, meditative sort of mood, and the mousy makes good his escape. Not finding a hole, it hides below something, from under which something is soon raked out again, and so the cruel game goes on until the trembling little creature, with its shiny eyes, grows sick with hope deferred, and faints away. Seeing this, Pussy, after turning it over once or twice with mittened paw, jumps on my shoulder with a fond purr and begins to sing. The play is over, and by the by the mouse revives, and is graciously permitted to retire, which it sets about by doing with becoming modesty, and an air at once subdued and deprecatory. Muffy is still on my shoulder, benignly singing. Their eyes meet, and a little dialogue ensues. Mousy says with hers, Oh, please, your ladyship, may I go, ma'am? I feel so all overish. Your claws are so sharp, and your teeth so dreadful. But I'm a little, little mouse. To which Pussy replies, Yes, you may go. I shan't eat you today, only don't do it again. But why, you ask, should I permit such cruel sport? Because, intelligent and gentle reader, any interference of mine would change the play from a comedy in the parlor to a tragedy in the cellar. I have neither fishing nor hunting exploits to tell about Muffy. She is celebrated only as a great traveler, for her faithful devotion to her master, and for her care over even his property. Last summer I spent a month in a beautiful sequestered village in Yorkshire. My companions were, as usual, my Newfoundland, Muffy, a pet starling, and another dog. Muffy is very much attached to this birdie, allowing it to hop about her like a crow on a water buffalo. This starling, I think, is the most amusing little chap in all creation. He is a good linguist and an accomplished musician, and is never silent. If he is, he is either asleep or doing mischief. As he says whatever comes into his head, and interlards his discourse with fragments of tunes and bravos, the effect is sometimes startling. The way he jumbles his nouns together, and trots out every adjective he knows, to qualify every noun, is something worth listening to. In the summer evenings we used to go out for long rambles in the country lanes. The dog, Theodore Nero, 
felt himself in duty bound on these occasions, not only to look after his master, but even to take the cat under his protection. The starling stalked flies from my shoulder. Sometimes he would stay longer snail-hunting behind a hedge than I deemed prudent. A glance from me was all Muffy wanted to be after him. I would wait and listen, and presently I would hear Dick excitedly exclaiming, "'Eh, eh, what is it?' a favorite expression of his. "'What is it? You rascal, you rascal!' And back he would fly to his perch, apparently quite thunderstruck at the impudence of the cat. Muffy bids me say she is quite happy and all alive, and I would add she is very much all alive, most interestingly so, in fact. But that did not prevent her, last night, from preparing for me what was doubtless meant for a very pretty surprise and a high compliment. The cats in the neighborhood, hearing that I was writing a book in their favor, with Lady Muff as chief musician, resolved to serenade me, and they did. Being Christmas Eve, I took them for the waits at first. I am sorry now that I so far forgot myself as to throw cold water over the assembly. But I sincerely trust that they did not know that the gentleman in white who appeared on the balcony and so unceremoniously checked their harmony was the illustrious author of Cats. End of Volume 2, Chapter 9 Recording by Kate Sterner, Minneapolis, Minnesota Volume 2, Chapter 10 of The Cats. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malcolm Cameron. Cats. Their points and characteristics with curiosities of cat life, and a chapter on feline ailments by W. Gordon Staples. Volume 2, Chapter 10 Black Tom, the Skipper's Imp Tom's Introduction No one in the ship had the slightest idea how Tom came on board, or who brought him, or where he came from. He made his first appearance in public while, outward bound, we were crossing the Bay of Biscay, that strange mysterious sea beneath whose waves the bones of so many of our bravest countrymen lie bleaching. It was a roughish night, squally rather, without much sea on, but the wind changing its mind every minute, whisking into foam the crests of the inky waves, and carrying the spray far into the rigging. It was a night to try the sea legs of any one, so jerky and uncertain was the vessel's motion and the oldest sailors staggered like drunken men, and were fain to cling to their riggings or shrouds. I was smoking on the quarter-deck just before turning in. It had gone six bells in the first watch, and everything was snug for the night, when something black as Erebus whisked past me, visible but for a moment in the binnacle's light, and disappeared in the darkness forward. I looked inquiringly at the man at the wheel, a serious old seaman, who, in answer to my mute appeal, turned his quid twice in his mouth, and addressing the compass, "'That's the devil, sir,' said he, "'begging your pardon, sir. Came on board to-night when we were close-reefed topsail during a squall.' There was nothing disrespectful in the man's tone or bearing. Indeed, he spoke almost with an air of solemnity, "'Usual accompaniment, I suppose,' said I, laughing. "'Blue fire and a perfume not remellion. "'You know what ship that is, sir,' said he somewhat curtly. "'But there was a flash, young gentleman.' "'Seeing the man was disinclined to continue the subject, "'I went below and, thanks to the ship's motion, "'was soon in the land of dreams. "'Next day broke bright and clear.' Both wind and cloud had fled. The sea had gone down, and the vessel was under easy sail. A flock of gulls were circling in the morning air, screaming with delight as they picked the crumbs that floated astern, and all went merrily, oh! Presently the commander came up, looking 
anything but sweet, and all hands were immediately summoned aft for a speech. Officers and men of Her Majesty's gunboat Tickler, contrary to the customs and rules of the service, and without my knowledge, to say nothing of sanction, I find that a cat has been brought on board. Will the officer or man who owns the animal kindly step forward? Here the officers, verbally, and the man by their silence, disclaimed all ownership of poor puss. Then, continued the commanding officer, as no one seems to own it, I have but one course. Bring up the cat. All eyes were instantly turned towards the stern grating, which naturally caused the captain to wheel round. And there, sure enough, as mim as a mouse, with his tail curled round his legs for warmth, and looking on the very best of terms with himself and all creation, sat a large black tomcat. He lowered his brows as he returned the skipper's glance, and his eyes sparkled crimson and green. Midshipmen of the watch, was the order. See that cat overboard. Aye, aye, sir, sang out the middy. For noon watch, cat walks the plank, heave with a will, cheerly does it. Puss was on his legs in a moment, back erect, hair on end, and tail like a bottle brush spitting sputtering and behaving altogether in a highly mutinous and insubordinate manner this conduct very nearly led to a fatal termination by a whole shower of belaying pins which however hurled harmlessly over his head an inch of a miss is as good as a mile thought tom while there's life there's hope and I'll give you a race for it, my lads. And he cleared the deck at three bounds and dived below, followed by the whole watch. Three minutes trampling and howling below, then up through the forehatch came pursuers and pursued, pussy leading and the sailors astern, up the rigging shinned the cat. Follow your leader, roared the men. The chase now became general and most exciting, and with a cheer all hands joined, evidently more for the fun of the thing than with any intention of harming the cat. Up the rigging and down the stays, allow and aloft, out on the flying jib boom and along the hammock nettings. Sure, never before was such feats of agility seen on board a British man-o'-war. The men seemed monkeys, the cat the devil incarnate. With a strength seemingly supernatural, Tom at length scrambled up and took refuge above the main truck where the Dutch Admiral of old hoisted the broom, swearing, as only a Dutchman can, that he would sweep the English from the sea, and the men returned to the deck, gasping and red from their futile exertions, to await further orders. Black Tom speaks a piece. Curses on that brute, muttered the commander. Am I to sail the seas with a black cat on my main truck? Steward, bring me my revolver. The revolver was brought, but the captain's aim seemed unsteady. He fired all the six chambers without any further result than chipping the main top gallant yard. Poor Tom, seeing the serious turn matters had taken and that his death was compassed, determined to speak a few words in his own behalf, and with this intention he lifted up his forepaw, and, now looking below, now appealing to heaven, he delivered a harangue, the like of which none of us had ever listened to on shore, much less afloat. His meaning, however, was perfectly plain. Around him, he said, behold a waste of waters. He was far from land. He had no boat, and though he knew he could swim, although he never tried, he would rather die than wet his feet. Had we no compassion, no bowels of mercies, he wanted to harm nobody. 
What good would shooting him do? He was willing to remain where he then stood for the rest of the voyage. In fact, to do anything or everything if his life were only spared. The captain smiled. I thought, said he, I was a better shot. However, give the devil his due. And he ordered all hands to treat the cat kindly, if ever he came below again. Tom retained his elevated seat for fully two hours, and finally fell sound asleep. Waking calm and refreshed, and perhaps somewhat dizzy, he stretched himself a leg at a time, for he hadn't much room, yawned, did an attitude, and came slowly down on deck. He walked at once to the quarter-deck, and, to show that he harbored no ill feeling, he actually went and rubbed his big black head against the captain's leg. Tom becomes ship's cat. Henceforward, Tom was no longer a mere passenger on board. His name was born on the ship's books, and he was tolerated both by officers and men. Somehow, Tom became no favorite. The questionable manner in which he had made his first appearance, and the latent devil that seemed to lurk in his eye, acted like a spell on the natural superstitions of the sailors, more than one of whom was heard to express an opinion that, that black, alliterative term of endearment used by British seamen, will bring the ship no good luck. Now, whether out of gratitude for having his life spared, or for some other feline motive known only to Puss, certain it is that Tom attached himself to our commander and to no one else on board. For whenever that officer came on deck, so did the cat trotting by his side and enlivening his walk by a song. When any other gentleman happened to be walking with the captain, Tom used to take his station on the hammock netting and follow every motion of his beloved adopted master with eyes that beamed with admiration. This show of affection was at first indignantly resented by the skipper, and many a good kick Tom used to have for his pains. But the more he was kicked, the louder he sang. So at long last, yielding to the force of circumstances, the skipper ceased to mind him, and the two became inseparable. Tom goes on shore for a walk. Nothing very unusual happened during our long voyage to the Cape. Tom went on shore at St. Helena, like any other officer, and it was fondly hoped he would take up his abode on that beautiful island. But having visited the principal places of interest, nearly murdered a poor little dog in Jamestown, and, this is only conjecture, taken a rat or two at Napoleon's tomb, Tom came off again in the officer's boat. On board again. The cat might in time have come to be a general favorite in the ship, but he suffered no advances to be made by any man, Jack, as the saying is, and scowled so unmistakably when anyone attempted to stroke him that he was unanimously voted to Coventry and allowed to do what he liked. Tom had a regular allowance of ship's provisions, like anyone else, but his greatest treat was milk preserved and rum thickened with oatmeal. For this, he used to come regularly once and often twice a day to the dispensary. His favorite seat was on the weather bulwarks, and there he would often remain for hours, gazing thoughtfully down in the blue clear depths of the tropical ocean. He do be counting the jellyfish and looking for sharks, one man remarked. Nay, said another, he's a thinking of home. Maybe he left a wife and babies in old England. Then, 
said the first speaker. What a tarnation fool he is. Not to stop on shore. Sure, no one sent for him. Hush, said the first. He's an evil spirit, Bill. As sure as a gun. And he belongs to the skipper. You may easily guess from the foregoing conversation that the captain himself was no great favorite. He was a little red-haired, foxy-faced man, a Scotsman, save the luck, but a Scotsman who hated the land of his forefathers, whose heart had ne'er within him burned, etc., etc. In fact, retaining but one trait of Scottish character, namely, his love for scotch drink. Once round the Cape, and north on our cruising ground, the Mozambique Channel, the skipper shone out in his true colors. His face and nose got daily redder, and this sinister smile that seemed printed there never left his lips. Such a smile I have never seen before nor since, except on the face of a Somali Indian. The first victims to the skipper's wrath were the poor black crewmen, one of whom was always stationed at the masthead to look out for strange sails. Now the commander had an eye like a fishhawk, and generally managed to sight a vessel before even the outlook. God help the outlook when this occurred. He was ordered down at once, and in one minute more was lashed to the rigging by both wrists, and writhing and shrieking for mercy, under the infliction of two dozen with a rope's end, laid on by the sturdy arms of a fellow crewman. The men, for the slightest offense, had their grog stopped for a week or weeks, and as the proceeds went to swell the sick fund, a fund to purchase comforts for the patients, I had usually more money in my hands than I knew how to expend, until I happily thought of a plan to get rid of the surplus cash. Brown, I would say to an officer, after the cloth had been removed. You look unusually seedy today. In fact, looking round the mess, you all look rather pale. Effects of climate poor devils. I'm afraid I have hardly done my duty towards you. Stuart, bring in those bananas from the sick bay. Bring also the pineapples, the mangoes, the oranges, the ground nuts, a pomola, and a bottle of Madeira. Liquor up, my lads. Let us drink to the skipper's health. The sick bay fund is unusually flourishing, so don't forget, in every port we come to, to ask me for honey for your rum milk for your tea, and orange blossoms to perfume your cabins withal. Anything approaching insubordination among the boys or men on board was punished with flogging, four dozen lashes, with a different boatswain's mate to each dozen was the usual dose. Tom had a flogging. Tuesday was flogging day, and to add if possible, to the terror of the condemned wretch, after the gratings were rigged and the man stripped and lashed thereto, sawdust was sprinkled on the deck all around to soak up the blood. But at every flogging match, there sat old Nick in shape of a beast, at least in the shape of Tom the Cat, who would not have missed the fun for all the world. There on the bulwark, he would sit, his eyes gleaming with satisfaction, his mouth squared, and his beard all a bristle. He seemed to count every dull thud of his nine-tailed namesake, and emitted short, sharp mews of joy, when, towards the middle of the third dozen, the blood began to trickle and get sprinkled about on sheet and shroud though I never disliked Tom. Still, at times such as these, I really believed he was the devil himself as reputed, and would have given two months' pay for a chance to brain him. When the flogging was over, 
Tom used to jump down and, purring loudly, rub his head against his master's leg. By at least one half of the crew, Tom was assuredly believed to be, if not old Nick himself, possessed of an evil spirit. A good deal of mumbo-jumbo work therefore went on, for the men tried to find favor in Tom's eyes, and many a dainty morsel did this cat of evil repute thus receive, so that he grew and flourished like a green bay tree, while his coat got glossier and his figure plumper every day. How Tom used to fish. Although well fed and cared for, Tom at times used to forage for himself. Not that I ever heard he was a thief, to his honor be it written, but he fished and very successfully, too, without so much as wetting the soles of his beautiful pumps. His modus operandi was as follows. On dark nights, in the tropical seas, he used to perch himself on the bulwarks aft, and bend his glittering eyes downward into the sea. He never sat long thus, without a flying fish, sometimes two, jumping past him or over him and alighting on deck. Then Tom would descend and have a delightful supper, and if not fully satisfied, resume his seat and continue the sport. Tom must have gained his knowledge from experience, although the success of his method of fishing is easily explained. It is well known that these fish always fly towards a light which is therefore often used by the sailors to catch them. The cat required no other light save the glimmering of his two eyes, which in the dark shone like a couple of kohinoors. Tom takes charge of a gun. Tom was in the habit of going to sleep in the large pivot gun we used for shelling running away slavers. For a forenoon nap, Nothing could have suited him better. It combined the pleasure of solitude with retirement, and moreover, was both dark and cool. One fine sunny day, we were in chase of a particularly fast dow, which, taking no heed of our signal howitzers, evinced a strong disposition to edge in towards the shore. The order was accordingly given to fire at her with our big Ben. Before loading, the gunner keeked in to see that all was clear. And sure enough, there was Tom. By no means pleased at being disturbed in his siesta, neither could any amount of cheaty pussying entice him from his snuggery, while tickling with the end of a ramrod only made him spit and sputter and make use of bad language. "'What's the delay?' cried the captain. "'Cat in possession of gun, sir,' was the reply. "'Dear me, dear me,' whined the captain. "'Rouse him out and be quick about it.' After a pause, "'He won't rouse out no how, sir,' said the gunner. "'I'm hanged,' roared the skipper. If that rascally Dow isn't landing her slaves in shore, rouse him out, I say. Fire a fuse. Confound the cat. Shoal water ahead, sir, from the man at the masthead. Hard a port. Stand by both anchors. And round we went, just in time to save us. In the meantime, a fuse had been inserted in the touch hole of the gun. Bang! And thus attacked in the rear, Tom came out of the gun faster than ever he had done in his life, and took to the rigging with hair on end and eyes all aflame. Lower away the first and second cutters, was now the order. It shan't be said that a cursed cat kept us from capturing a lawful prize. Damn the beast! For the benefit of those who love strong language, alias, swearing, it must be here stated that in courtesy to my lady readers, 
I abstain from giving the skipper's language verbatim, for in that respect he would have pleased a Lancashire coal heaver. He was a don in the use of expletives, although, to his credit be recorded, while freely launching forth anathemas at the limbs of his men and consigning their eyes to perpetual punishment, he just as freely let his own eyes have it. Oh, he wasn't particular by any means. He gave it to us all alike, officers and men, cat and crew boys. He captured the slaver, though, went in the boats personally to do it, and that night the sea was lighted up for miles with a blaze that spoiled pussy's fishing for once. It was a caution to slavers on shore and sharks at sea. At a good mile's distance, we could see to read our last letters from home by the light of that burning dhow. We were not surprised to see the captain come on board, black with smoke and begrimed with gunpowder, for we had heard desultory firing. But we were slightly taken aback to see Tom meet him in the gangway, and to observe the captain stoop down and tenderly caress him. Perhaps he wanted to make up to him for his former roughness. I've given that chap Carrick Fergus, he remarked, in a sort of general way to us officers, and to me he added, I suppose the men may have a glass of grog, doctor. Certainly, I said. Steward, splice the main brace. Then the skipper dived below and got drunk, which he had the knack of doing on the very shortest notice. The Cat's Cantrips Of Tom's adventures on board the saucy little tickler, very much could be written. Somehow, he never was safely out of one scrape till into another. A dear wee mongoose was once brought on board and would doubtless have become a great pet, if Tom had not broken its back on the first night of its arrival. A monkey was received as a visitor, and with him Tom at once declared war, and kept it up to the bitter end. The monkey's favorite mode of attack was to run aloft with a belaying pin, and, biding his time, let it drop as if by accident on poor pussy's head. But Tom let him have it sharp and fierce whenever he caught him. Once, I remember, the monkey was sitting on his hindquarters on deck, stuffing his cheeks with cockroaches and looking as serious as a judge. Tom spied him and ran cautiously along the bulwarks. Then, springing on his foe, he seized him round the neck with one arm, and with the other administered such a drubbing as the poor thing never had before in his life. The monkey with bleeding face at length escaped to the main top, and there cried itself to sleep. Whether or not Tom was the Jonas, who caused all the mishaps that fell on our little vessel during that four years' cruise, I shall not pretend to say. Although all hands forward firmly believed he was, like the witch-wife in Alan Ramsay's Gentle Shepherd, Tom got the white of a felut, and certainly Snarleyow and his master were never more detested than that black cat and the skipper eventually came to be. Lifeboat Cruise Ahoy Once, I remember, we experienced a spell of weather so dark and unsettled that a general gloom prevailed in the ship fore and aft. We were rounding the cape in midwinter. First, we had a gale of wind. A bulwark stove in forward, and a boat washed overboard. Then, several days with no wind, but a heavy sea on, and the horizon close aboard of us on every side. The nights were pitchy dark, with thunder and lightning so appalling that no one thought of turning in, till far on in the middle watch. Scenes like these can never be described. They are painted with the finger of awe on the beholder's memory, 
and time cannot efface them. I can see even now our little vessel, hanging bows onto the side of that dark wave, the hill of water rising above us, the inky gulf beneath, her wet and slippery decks, and the faces of the men that cling to the cordage, ghastly in the lightning's glare. A moment more, and we are on the brow of the wave. Then down we drive into the very trough of the sea, where for a few seconds the ship lies trembling, as if every timber in her sides was instinct with life. On such a night as this, Tom fell overboard. This may seem like a descent from the sublime to the ridiculous. It is a fact, however, and it was a very disagreeable descent indeed for poor Tom. The life buoy was almost instantly fired and let go by the commander himself, who alone saw the accident. Ease her, stop her, he roared. Away, lifeboat's crew. Up tumbled the crew. The boat was lowered, and in two minutes more they had dropped astern and were pulling with might and main for the now distant life buoy. The storm had by this time passed over, save an occasional flash of lightning. For fully ten minutes, each time we rose on the crest of a great wave, we could distinctly see the life buoy's light, burning bright and beacon-like away to leeward of us. Then it flickered feebly and finally went out. Gracious heaven, exclaimed the captain, that light was never extinguished. It has gone out. Five minutes, ten, fifteen minutes elapsed in dead silence. We leant over the bulkwarks and could feel our hearts throbbing against them as we peered into the darkness and listened for the slightest sound. Only an occasional glimmer played along the horizon, only now and then the splash of a breaking wave. Hours passed by, and still no signal from the deep to tell us aught of life was there. And all that long dismal night, rockets were let off, blue lights burned, and big guns fired, but the sea gave never a sign. How anxious we all were. No one had a thought of retiring. The captain spent his time in alternately pacing frantically up and down the deck and in diving down below. We all knew for what. At last he wept like a child and tore his hair out in handfuls. I felt sorry for him at first, until I heard him curse his own evil fate, cause his fourteen years' service would all be lost. He was self, not the poor men he was thinking of. But the longest time has an end, and morning came at last. And just as the horizon was becoming dimly visible through the rising mist, and silence was reigning fore and aft, for both men and officers were tired out with suspense and long watching, we were all startled and rendered as wide awake as ever we were in our lives. For, borne along on the morning air, breeze it could hardly be called, came a faint shout. One moment, all hands listened. It was repeated. Shout, my lads, cried the captain, all his manhood returning at once and such a ringing cheer was sent over the waters as only could proceed from the lungs of British sailors. My, how every face brightened, and my, how every eye glanced and glittered as the boat loomed out from the fog. She was soon alongside, all hands were safe, and the first on board was the skipper's imp. There was one old sailor who had been very quiet all the night, but who now burst into such sobbing as I've never heard before. 
The poor man's son had been in the boat. Did we splice the main brace? <laughs> Rather, we spliced it on deck, and we went below to the wardroom and spliced it again. In fact, the main brace took a good deal of splicing. Then we turned in and slept till noon, and I dreamt I was spliced myself. Ship on Fire If I remember rightly, we were somewhere in latitude 17 degrees south, and a good way off land. We had been cracking on all the forenoon under steam after a northern slave ship, which we had finally boarded, captured, and taken in tow. A fine pair of heels she had shown us, too. We had to burn hams to get within shot of her, but we did at last. And there she was, with a prize crew on board, and the fiery old Arabs glaring like evil spirits at us as they leaned over her taffrail. A breeze had sprung up towards four o'clock, and the orders were given to bank fires and set sail. I was sitting in the wardroom reading when, Look, Jim, I heard someone on deck remark, Where is that thundering old cat going to now? Bedad, then, said Jim. But he's taken the rigging like a good one anyhow. Shouldn't wonder now if he's going to give us another space. I ran up just in time to see the cat shin hand over hand up the main top gallant mast and seat himself on the very truck in the exact spot he had occupied in his first adventure on board when the captain fired at him. It had gone three bells in the first dog watch. We had just finished tea and gone on deck to smoke our evening pipe. We were making ourselves very comfortable on the stern grating, and our Scotch engineer, naval engineers for the most part are Scotch, was singing for we are homeward bound. Not that we were homeward bound by a long chalk, but it gave us the idea we were, don't you know? Made us feel all the jollier when the quartermaster came aft and addressing the officer of the watch. I beg your pardon, sir, he said leisurely, turning his quid in his mouth. But I think, sir, there be a strong smell of fire right amidships. We went forward. The second cutter lay bottom upwards, between the fore and main mass, and from under its gunwale were curling little puffs of light blue smoke, for all the world as if someone were smoking a cigar beneath the boat. But the smoke had the smell of burning wood. Ding, 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 ding. Ah, had Edgar Allan Poe heard that bell, he might have added one other stanza to that strange wild poem of his. Ding, 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 ding. You never heard it, did you, reader? Well, it's a pleasure you still have before you. The breeze was freshening every minute, the sea was getting its back up, and the darkness thickened around us. But what mattered, darkness? We should soon light up the old ocean with our burning ship. Ding, ding, ding! Up tumbled the hands at the dread summons. The hoses are laid, the pumps rigged and manned as if by magic, and before the last sound of the bell is borne away on the breeze, every man is at quarters steady, grave, and silent, waiting. Waiting? I. Fancy having to wait a single moment, with the fire crackling under the broiling deck, and tons of powder under hatches. But service is service. The captain alone had not responded to the alarm, and the officer of the watch had gone to call him. Worthy man he was. Not foul, he just was glorious. O'er all the ills of life victorious. Oh, he said, ship's on fire, is she? Then go you to blazes. He came up soon, however, and every man that night did his duty. Nothing in the world, save British pluck and coolness, could have conquered that fire. 
It was the padding at the back of the boiler that had caught, and burning through, had kindled the coals behind, and when the decks were scuttled, the scene below was like a red, raging hell. In less than two hours, however, the flames were got under and the fire extinguished, and, saving the watch on deck, the crew, tired and bruised, and many of them scalded, had gone below while the carpenters were busy repairing decks, for in a man of war every trace of recent danger, whether from wind or fire or foe, is speedily erased. A shoal of sharks that had been following the ship expectant, disappointed, sought deeper water, and Black Tom, the cat, came down from his perch on the main truck, singing a song of deliverance. Minor Mishaps It would take a long time indeed to narrate all the misadventures we had in that cruise. We got quite used to running on shore, being awakened any night, with the strange grating noise beneath our keel, and the sudden cessation of all motion which tells the experienced sailor better than words can, that the ship has struck. One bright moonlit night, far on in the middle watch, we ran aground on the Lyra Reef. Luckily, the tide was not full, nor the wind blowing. By next morning, we had lowered the boats, sent over the guns to lighten ship, and lay waiting for the tide. A bright sky, and a blue-blue sea all around, with never a sail in sight, nay, not even a bird. The water so pellucid and clear that leaning over the bulwarks we could see the yellow sand at the bottom, see forests and gardens of marine plants, and flowers pink-petaled or tender green gently waving to and fro in the current. See the transparent medusae disporting their rainbow beauties, and see the thousand and one strange-looking tropical fishes of color so bright and shapes so grotesque that they seem the fishes of our dreams or caricatures of animal life. Fast and sure on that reef we lay for upwards of forty-eight hours, and it was only by lightening the ship of coals and buoying her with empty rum casks that we got safely afloat at last. The men were in good spirits all the time, because, forsooth, the cat was singing like all possessed. Nothing to eat. It was the last voyage of the cruise. We were steering from Zanzibar to the Cape under orders home. We had on board with us no less a personage than the Bishop of C.A. and his learned curate, Dr. Blank. Now we had not been to sea over three days when, lo and behold, one half at least of the casks of beef and provisions supposed to be full were found to be mere dummies. It was nobody's fault. It always is nobody's fault in a case of that sort. But the upshot of it was that all hands were put upon short allowance, and as our mess, having got into debt, was just then living on ship's provisions, we officers had to suffer the same privation as the men. Besides, we had neither beer, wine, nor spirits on board, very little water, and no coals to spare to distill more. This was a very pretty lookout for a three weeks' voyage to the Cape in midwinter, and poor Tom came in for more cursing now than ever. Everybody cursed him everywhere. They cursed him below and cursed him aloft, cursed him on the quarter-deck and cursed him in the cook's galley. But Tom only sung the louder. It was all along that blessed cat, the sailors said, and they added, that it was a good thing we had my lord bishop on board to counteract the evil effects of the skipper's imp. The poor bishop suffered, too but mostly from seasickness. He kept his bed all the voyage. He was a stout man at Zanzibar, 
but he got considerably thinner before we reached the Cape. But his curate was more to be pitied. He was a thin man, didn't get sick, and had a stomach like a brewer's horse, and the more sorrow for that same, there being so little to put into it. Our biscuit must, I think, have been baked before the flood. Each morsel, while black with cockroaches filth outside, entertaining a whole colony of weevils inside. We ate the weevils, however, merely tapping each morsel on the table to get rid of the superabundant dust, before conveying it into our mouths. We had neither potatoes nor butter. We had white beans, though, and black rice, and fried sardines, to which later we used to add a little turmeric and cayenne by way of flavoring. We actually got mean in our hunger, and used to say little snappish things to each other about our share of the victuals, things which we would have been ashamed to say under any other circumstances. No one, I can assure you, was above helping himself to the last spoonful of rice or beans, out of a delicate feeling of consideration for his neighbor. In good sooth, sometimes three or four spoons would meet at the dish at once in most undignified haste. Gentlemen, gentlemen, our little good-natured assistant paymaster would say, Better is a dinner of rice and fried sardines where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. We should just have liked to have seen the stalled ox, that's all. But this assistant paymaster was a stout, bulky little chap, and didn't suffer half what we did. I'm certain he lived on his own fat all the way to the Cape just as the sheep in the highlands do when they have the misfortune to be buried in the snow for a week or two. Our conversation at the dinner hour, when we weren't quarreling, used to be about this glorious feed, and the next glorious feed, which we once had, and it would certainly have been amusing for an outsider, who wasn't hungry himself, mind you, to have heard us enlarging on all the dainties that had been set before us in happier times. Our conversations would have been somewhat after the following fashion. Yes, but by George, when I was in the P&O company service, I, old fella, that was the place to live. There is where we used to get these spirits. All. Yes, yes, tell us there's a dear boy. What had you for dinner? Yes, well, you know, the bill of fare used to be two yards long and a yard and a quarter wide. We had two soups and then all. No, no, tell us first what the soups were. Yes, well, say vermicelli and macaron. Oh, hang it all, Morton. That's the third time to my certain knowledge that you've helped yourself to rice. Morton. Tomorrow's pea soup day. Never mind. Yes, but I do mind. All. Go on with the yarn. Yes. Well, vermicelli and macaroni, and then a bit of delicious white turbo with oyster sauce, and all. Yes, yes. Go on. Yes, all very well to say go on, but I shall have those three beans, you greedy beggars. Well, then after the fish came, etc., etc., etc. When S had finished, R would begin. That just reminds me of a hotel I was at in France, etc., and so each one told his experiences to the infinite delectation of his neighbors, and having locust-like devoured everything we came across, we used to get up hungry and haggard, and run on deck to smoke away the tail end of our appetites. In those days, our grace, before and after meat, 
was rather a peculiar one. The president said the first. It was, Curse the cat! Then, just before we rose from table, Mr. Weiss, will you kindly return thanks? Confound the cat! The Last of the Skipper's Imp No one ever saw the last of him. However, although a seaman called Davis swore point-blank that he had seen the cat fly overboard in a sheet of blue flame, but then Davis was the biggest lubber and the greatest liar in the ship, the only thing known for certain is this. We were about three days' sail from Simmons Town, Cape of Good Hope, the night was dark, and the weather squally, and poor Tom was last seen sitting, very quiet and pensive-like, on the hammock netting aft. He was seen there, I say, in the middle watch, and he was never seen again, alive or dead. The men swore roundly that he was a devil nothing more nor less, and that being a devil, he couldn't stomach my lord bishop on board, and consequently took French leave and went home. The truth, I suppose, is that the ship gave a nasty lee lurch, and Tom, half asleep, missed his footing, tumbled overboard. I know the skipper was sorry. We kept a good lookout for the flying Dutchman after Tom's demise, but very much to my disappointment, we did not fall in with that ghostly ship. If I were merely writing a sailor's yarn, I should certainly say we had seen her and give a most photographic-like description of her. But such stories I leave landsmen to tell. For I think if a man has been for ten or a dozen years at sea, and kept his weather eye lifting all the time, it will take him the remainder of his life to tell the whole truth alone. When we came down to the Cape, which we managed to do without any further adventures, there lay the new Admiral's ship all spick and span from England shores, so all our fellows were turned over to, and went home in the old admiral's ship, all except our engineer and my unhappy self. We, much to our disgust, were reappointed to the saucy tickler, which was to remain out for another commission, as tender to the new flagship. Now, however, we had a new captain, the jolliest little man alive, new officers, and a new crew, and we were all as jolly as sandboys. The new officers thought themselves tremendously clever chaps, and every night they used all to pull off their slippers and go pell-mell at the unfortunate cockroaches. But the engineer and I sat like stoics and let them crawl over us in scores, and if too many at one time came on the book we might be reading, we gently removed them. But before a month was over, our messmates found out the futility of trying to diminish the number of cockroaches, and these interesting creatures had carte blanche all over the ship. We sailed for Bombay. But though Black Tom was no more, ill luck seemed still to hover in the wake of that little vessel. I would willingly narrate our further adventures in detail, but somehow I have no heart now that the cat has left the story. But how we were caught in a gale off the Cape and the ship taken aback, that, reader, is much more dreadful than it appears on paper. How we sprang a leak a week after, glass falling and weather stormy on a rock-bound coast, and just as the ship was beginning to stagger like a drunk man, and the boats were got ready for lowering, the engineer, brave little man, dived below water in the engine room and found it was no leak at all, but the great sea cock left open by a drunken stoker. 
how we ran on shore on that wild reef outside Johanna and lay there for a whole week with our keel floating in splinters around us, how we finally got off, and steamed to Bombay almost a wreck, the pumps going continually and barely keeping her afloat, how we arrived safely through it all, how a liberal government paid rather more for repairing her than would have bought a new one and how she was sold three years after for an old song. Is it not all written in the log of Her Majesty's saucy gunboat, Tickler? End of Volume 2, Chapter 10 End of Cats, Their Points and Characteristics, with Curiosities of Cat Life, and a Chapter on Feline Ailments by W. Gordon Staples.